Welcome to Imaginative Visions Journeys, where creators from the entertainment world discuss their journey to turning their dreams into reality with your host, Justin D. Williams. Welcome to another episode of the Magic Division's Journeys. This will also be on the TacosTheGeeks.com as we continue our Holly Shorts Film Festival 2023 coverage. And today we have Gabrielle, Gab- Gab- Gabriella Garcia Medina, and she's going to be talking about her short film, Birdie, the Brilliant. And as always, we I'll give you a brief synopsis later, but we are going to talk first. First question I have for you, Gabriella, is, when did you, because we always like to focus on origins and people's upbringing, how they fell in love with their craft. Do you remember the first time you fell in love with directing or writing or just the art of film? I mean, I've always loved film. Uh, I just never really thought it was accessible to me uh, because there were no, uh, there were not a lot of women directors when I was growing up and especially not no Cuban women directors when I was growing up. Even now there's I don't know any personally Cuban female directors. Um, so I just never felt like it was accessible to me, but I always like loved movies uh, from a very young age and television. And just, I was babysat by the TV, you know, uh, cause my parents were, would work late. And so, um, yeah, just so for a long time, I was like, okay, well, I could be an actor or I could be a writer, but I can't be a director. And mm-hmm. so I went to school to UCLA. I studied acting. I studied uh, writing. Uh, I double minored in Chicano studies and African-American studies because I really wanted to bring depth to my work. And then, um, yeah, and then I was a writer. I was a pretty, you know, I did really well as a spoken word poet for about 10 years. Uh, I would perform at universities and colleges all over the United States. And then when I turned 30, I was like, you know what, like, if I can make it as a poet, uh, I can make it as anything. So I'm going to go shoot my shot and, and be a director. And so I went to grad school, I studied film just more intensively and more intensively. Um, And I made four short films while I was at CalArts. And then I graduated with two feature screenplays. And then I've been making films ever since. I haven't stopped. And can you tell us about your first short film? What was that like being in behind behind the chair for like the first time as being a, a director? So my first short film that I wrote and directed will never see the light of day. Um, <laughs> it's so bad. It is I hear that a lot. <laughs> I made it. It cost me $3,000. And uh, all my friends were part of it. And they helped me make it. And uh, the production design was gorgeous. And like the mood and the tone was gorgeous. But the film was terrible. Uh, because uh, I realized it always starts with story and I, I didn't have a very good story. Um, mm. And I tried to craft a story in the edit and it just didn't, I just have a really shitty movie. So um, that's never going to see the light of day, but I learned my lesson. And then I made a uh, little con Lily, which um, was a two day shoot. And I had a really good script. It was uh, based it was a proof of concept for my feature and so it, there's a lot of heart and a lot of personality and a lot of tone and a lot of me in it and so when I made that that did really well and so um, yeah just everything about that process felt so right and I felt so connected to every part of from the development phase from the writing phase all the way until the last touch on the film um, just felt very organic and, and very positive. And, and I knew that it was going to do well. I just didn't expect it to do so well. Mm. Um, and it did, it did extremely well. Um, and I got, you know, I won awards and I ended up distributing with HBO and, um, it ended up just like killing it. I got representation from that. So yeah, so that really was my first one that the world will ever see. (laughs) <laughs> and can you talk about a little bit before we transition to Birdie, a little bit more of your origins when it comes to your writing process of how you because you, you're, you're a double threat as well. You're, you're writing and you're directing. And that gives a lot more creative freedom to really make sure that your vision is the way you want it to be. Can you talk a little bit about what have what the benefits of being able to do both? 
Yeah. Um, okay. So writing is exciting because I get to sit by myself and I get to build an entire world and I get to see in through my words, I get to put down sort of what I'm visualizing in my head. Um, but at the same time, it's very lonely and it's very scary because I'm going down that path by myself. Um, so I don't always, you know, a lot of times I second guess myself and I'm like, is this the right path to go? Because, you know, sometimes I wish I had more collaboration in writing. So luckily I have a community where I can be like, Hey, can you read this? It's like, a, can I go down this other path or can I, what, like, give me some fresh energy. Give me, because I think what I love about writing is that control to, to very specifically build this entire universe that's going to set the tone and the style and the characters. Uh, but at the same time, what I don't love about it is that it is so just you. So the same things that you gain from writing, which is building this thing so specific to your vision, is also a potential for not having the best written thing because you don't have the, you know, the support or ideas from, from collaborators. And that's what I love about directing is mm -hmm. the collaboration. Um, so when I was a spoken word poet for 10 years, all I did was travel to universities and perform a one woman show by myself. Um, and what I yearned for film was the directing, because when you're directing, you depend, you cannot make a movie without a team. Like you literally need at least another person, you know, an, an actor. And so <clears throat> the collaborative and like I come in with an idea and I come in with a really solid pitch deck and I'll come in with like um like a plan like this is what I want uh but then I love hearing like my production designer being like yeah but what about this and then like my you know costume designer yeah but what if we use color in this way mm -hmm. and so then that just makes everything so much better and so much richer and Yes, it's my film at the end of the day, but it's all of our film. And that's my favorite part of it. So yeah, I love the writing. And yes, it helps me set that vision and that initial thing. But I'm also, my goal is not that of like an ego. So I don't need to like have written and, you know, directed my stuff. Like if someone else has an idea and they want to come on board and co-write it or make it better, like I'm all for it. Uh, because ultimately what I want to do, yes, I want to be a writer and director, but I mostly just want to put out really good films into the world. Um, so that was a really long-winded answer. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, no. That's excellent, actually. And that actually transitions to your new film, Birdie the Brilliant. And my first question, first, it was really good. I really, very sweet, very lighthearted. I like uh, I like the tone of it, uh, especially with uh, Birdie. Birdie was just such a cute character. Uh, can you talk about the, because you've written this one as well. Can you talk about how did you come up with this particular concept? Yeah, so this is an example of something I wrote, and then mm -hmm. I shared it with my husband, who's also a collaborator, and I said, hey, give me some some thoughts on this, and then he ended up giving me so many thoughts that I was like, all right, you got to get a co-writing credit, like, I can't take this credit by myself, um, but that's an example of that, but it originated from, um, I a few years ago, I had my aunt, my grandmother, and my cousin visit me, uh, and they were you know, going down memory lane. And my aunt tells me a story about my cousin when she was eight years old. My cousin's now in her thirties. Mm -hmm. uh, and when she was eight years old, she was growing up in Cuba and they didn't have any money. And um, there was this like little hot dog stand like near our house. And my cousin really wanted to buy a hot dog, but you know, it was like a dollar fifty, And so she didn't have money. So every day my aunt would be like, hey, if you help out around the house, I'll give you a little bit of change here hey, if you go do these chores, I'll give you a little bit of change there. And so she started doing all these things around her house um, to raise money to buy this hot dog. And then when it was finally she had the money, she went out to buy it. Before she left the house, she overheard my grandparents just talking among themselves about how they hadn't tasted milk in such a long time. Because in Cuba, milk had been limited to only kids under seven by that point because mm. things were really hot. And so when she went out to get her hot dog, she came home with a bottle of milk from the black market instead. And my aunt, when she was retelling the story, like, I don't know, 20, 30 years later, um, she started crying. And I realized like, wow, this story 
it's so powerful that it transcends time. It is yeah. timeless. It is universal that this little kid really wants this thing and they're working so hard to get it. But then they realize that the world is bigger than this thing that they want. And there are more important things out there and they make the sacrifice and they make the right choice. And so that sort of was the original idea for Birdie. Um, and then it, you know, it turned into what it is. So and one thing I really like about it, because I'm I'm an eighties baby, grew up in the nineties, and I too had similar upbringing with allowance. Like do chores around the house, you get an allowance, you get certain for a certain month, a certain amount a week or a month, you know, for the work that you put in. And it really hammers home that work ethic upbringing I I saw growing up, and I was just like, oh my god, it's so weird. This these days is like it seems so weird. It's like there's a kid doing chores it's like it's I so know. refreshing to see <laughs> it, 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 and, and that's one thing i really like too it's also like the family dynamic between obviously grandma and, and birdie and um no spoilers folks i'm not giving any spoils but something happens in the film where birdie does have to make a similar choice he, I, yeah and, and it's just so it's so heartwarming when birdie realizes that it's like it's it's just refreshing to see like a child really growing up and really seeing like okay sacrifices that the family is going for can you talk a little bit about the themes of the movie especially when it comes to that family dynamic and you also included a lot of latino culture in this as well yeah so um yeah something that is really important to me honestly across the board is mm -hmm. that moment for a child where they have to make a decision that their innocence is shaken uh, and their naivete is like thrown away or, you know, they have to evolve from it. Um, so that's something that definitely happens in Birdie, but it happens in a very positive light. I like to explore yeah. that in many different lights. Um, and definitely with Birdie, I really wanted to make a very empowering, very positive, very bright, very poppy and very commercial, beautiful film. Um, in my other work, there's been some grit and there's some, there's an edge and those films I love as well. And I want to keep making, you know, all kinds of films. But with Birdie, I really, really wanted to craft something that made you want to when you were watching that made you feel really good and that felt like a Werther's original in your mouth and that when you walked out you saw you just walked out with your head held high just feeling proud uh, and happy and joyful uh and believing in a little bit of magic so that was something that I went into Birdie really wanting to come across and I mm -hmm. tried to make that come across in every aspect like from the writing to the visuals to the camera shots to the production design all of that was very carefully thought about to give you that feeling as a viewer. Uh, <clears throat> but some of the themes that were <clears throat> that I was exploring, one, definitely identity. I wanted Birdie to be interested in this drag king being that's like gender fluid, that's just this open, beautiful human person. Uh, and I wanted Birdie to be interested in them and admire them and look up to them, but not have Abuela have to make a comment about it, except mm. just and let it be part of normal life um and so it's just i wanted especially now you know and i made this movie right before like the the anti-drag bills i don't know if you're aware that happened yeah. in tennessee and um i made this one before that but i'm glad that i made it because it speaks so much to what's happening right now like what is wrong with this kid just admiring this beautiful creative being and performer? Um, so that was definitely an important theme um, in the movie. Another theme was definitely, you know, you work hard uh, and you learn the value of a dollar. Uh, yeah. Because Birdie, Birdie didn't realize, like, there's a scene where he's like, oh, yeah, I can raise the money. Like, I'll just sell my skateboard. I'll sell my Lego. Yeah. He doesn't realize the value. Like, I have kids my daughter doesn't understand where money comes from, you know, like she doesn't get mm -hmm. it. Again. I'm like, if you break something, like I can't just give you another one or, you know, I'm very much of like, let's turn the lights off and we're not in the room, save some energy. Um, but she doesn't get it. So th in the film, I tried, one of the themes is for Birdie to understand this concept of the value of money and, and why we need it. Uh, and then another big theme is community. Uh, I wanted uh, to show, I'm not afraid, you know, a lot of, uh, people 
do say like, oh, I'm tired of seeing Latinos playing maids and staff. And yeah. I'm not afraid of showing Latinos as maids and staff. As long as they're fully developed human beings, they mm -hmm. can be any role. Uh, why, sh why am I not allowed to have a maid in my story? Like, as long as she has a heart and humanity, then it doesn't matter what role my characters play. And so I really wanted to show a community of working class, blue collar people uh, of all races, really, because yeah. the, the staff is uh, very diverse, um, that come together. Like they may not have a lot, they come together to help Bertie get his dream in the end because they're a community, they're, 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 they have camaraderie among each other. So that was another big theme. And then of course, like the, 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 old, the bigger theme that's just really obvious is like, there's still magic all around us if we yeah. choose to see it. Um, so those are all the things I was trying to touch on with the film. And just the also like the heart of a child as well, because the innocence of Birdie. And one thing I really did like, which I didn't expect when I was watching it, was there were some musical numbers in here. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, uh, about how that came about? So, yeah, originally I wanted to make a musical um, mm. just because I'd already made two films before and that were good, that had gotten HBO distribution. And I wanted to do something different. I wanted to challenge myself and um, I wanted to bring in the spoken word part of my life into um, this new project because I never really dabbled in both together. So uh, because for my first two films, I had to like license music and it was so expensive and it's like such a process and you have to find like who has the master rights and the sync rights and like it's just it's a chore I was like you know what I'm just gonna write the songs and I'm gonna have musical numbers and so I ended up just using my background as a spoken word poet to craft these songs that were bilingual in English and Spanish and there's actually another song that didn't even make it into the film so I ended up there are like three songs together uh for Birdie um so that's really where it came from and I there was a, a song that I wanted to license but uh it was again too expensive and too difficult to reach who owns the rights of this and that and I was just like you know what I'm just gonna find music that sounds like this song and then I'm gonna write the lyrics that are not even gonna be kind of cool, but they're going to be exactly what I want them to be to fit this theme and this story. Um, and that's how the music came to be. And it was very beautifully shot. How long did you shoot for? So we shot for six days. Originally, we were going to shoot wow. for five, uh, but we did have a little, there was a hiccup on the first day where uh, one of the producers was supposed to pick up a truck uh, and they forgot. And so we ended up getting the truck four hours late to set. And so we ended up having to add another day um but it was great because you know it was a good that first day was a good first day for birdie to like practice i expected a lot from this little actor like he had to like sing and act and do magic and dance and like do all these things um mm -hmm. so and the first day of all days was the first day i was throwing him into like literally dance sing do this do that um and so it was nice to have that extra buffer day to fill in uh a little bit of the first day as well so and birdie's also going to be part of uh i believe it's latino public broadcasting i believe um yes yeah, so yeah. thank Can you for bringing about that, that. Up. That is so important um so the way i you know it's really hard to tell our stories um mm -hmm. it's really hard to get anyone to finance anything um so unless you have the money and you can just put it yourself, which is what I did with my first two films, because, you know, it's 3000 bucks, 2000 bucks, 4000 I just raised it. I worked four jobs and I was like, all right, I'm going to make a movie. Um, mm -hmm. But this one had a bigger budget and I couldn't front it. So I ended up, uh, uh, you know, applying for different grants and different things. And of course, I applied for the Latino Public Broadcasting Media Fund. And uh, I got this grant. It was a really generous grant. And not only was it money to, to making the movie, but it was also, it came with like the producers to support it. And like, oh, wow. they helped, you know, they helped me get a publicist. They helped me, you know, get it sent to PBS for their PBS Short Film Festival, which we ended up getting. Um, they really have been, they helped me figure out how to make it shorter. Like originally it was a 35 minute film and now we cut it down to 24, 25. So they were really instrumental in the whole process. And I couldn't have made this film without them. So Latino public broadcasting is a great resource. Uh, they are supporting Latino talent, not just in 
the narrative space, but also a lot of documentary as well. Mm -hmm. So if anybody listening or anybody out there, you know, is either a filmmaker and wants to tell a story that is, you know, profound and that has purpose and that has meaning and are they're struggling to find financing, I definitely say, please look into Latino public broadcasting. And if there's any, like, I, I don't know if they accept money from financiers, but if there are, and they want to look into Latino public broadcasting to support them, then please do that as well. And just a couple more questions before we uh, wrap it up. Oh, um, one of my questions I always ask anybody who's also in the Indies, what advice would you give somebody who's just wanted to be starting, whether it would be directing, writing, or acting? What advice could you offer them? Yeah, I would say invest in yourself. Um, because, yeah, like I would work, like I worked in call in grad school. I worked like four jobs. I was like a cocktail waitress. I was a tutor. I was, uh, you know, I, I, I just did have like a bunch of jobs and all the money I saved, I just used it on making films and I mm. asked friends to help me. And I, you know, I also was really good at like asking for free stuff. Like I would call up places and I would send these letters of like, Hey, this is what I'm trying to do. And this is why it's important. Um, I I'm a hustler. Like I've been hustling since I was a kid. And I think in order to make it in an industry that isn't ready to welcome you with open arms, you have to hustle and you have to like be constantly trying to sell yourself. So what I would say is bet on yourself, raise the money that you need, make it yourself. Um, and, you know, the other thing is I'm not afraid to like, oh, someone needs to go pick up a truck to get it on set. My role is not just, oh, I'm a director. I can't do that. No, I'll, I'll go pick up. I'll get up at five in the morning. I'll go pick up the truck. I'll bring it to set. And then I'll look at my script on set, um, which I did on Birdie, actually. Um, <laughs> after the first day when the truck, there was like a mishap with the truck. I'm like, all right, the truck will never be late again. I picked it up every single day after that. And <laughs> so um, That's what you have yeah. to do, though. <laughs> you have to you take that initiative. You have to do. So like, if it means like I got to go get lunch, like, okay, let's go get lunch, you know? Um just not being in this, like being able to wear many hats and not thinking that you're better than anyone else. And exactly. uh, just knowing that, why are you doing this? Are you doing this because you want to be famous? I'm not. I'm doing this because I want to make really fucking good art. I don't know if I can curse on your show. But oh, yes, you can. And, well, means. <laughs> and if, if, if making really good art means collaborating and listening to my peers and like building this really cool space, then then I want to do that. Uh, and also that's part of the fun. That's part, part of why I make the movie to begin with. So that would be my advice. And final question is, what do you hope people take from Bernie? And how can viewers, if you have a social media, how can viewers follow you and keep up to date with your career, your films and everything else? So Bernie is awesome, but our film is Bernie. Bur Bur oh, sorry. <laughs> Birdie. Birdie. <I> <laughs> no, it's sorry all good. That. So from Bernie. Um, well, Bernie is going to be playing on August 17th at Holly Shorts at 2.30, a part of the Latinx uh, block. So if you're around and you want to come, please come. Um, I did start a production company. It's on um, definitely on Instagram. And we also have a website. Uh, our Instagram account, it's Mira Mira, uh, Mira Mira Pictures. I'm like, I forgot it for one second. Mira Mira Pictures. Um, we're on Instagram. Uh, and I've made all my films through my production company. My hope is to continue to build my production company and make you know bigger projects and and yeah um so that's on instagram and i'm also on instagram at uh gabrielita cubanita i know it's hard to say uh it's just like um in in spanish uh like a pet name you always add ita at the end so gabrielita cubanita so um that's my instagram account but you can just find me through my name and uh yeah and the website is my name and the the business production company website is also meetamitapictures.com. So um, yeah, come check out Birdie and uh, you can also watch it on PBS and please also check out Latino Public Broadcasting. Thank you very much. Have a great one. Thank you for joining us for Imaginative Visions Journeys. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest from Imaginative Visions, you can visit imaginativevisions.com.